and I'm very thankful for this beautiful invitation. Um, I think it means a lot to bring my work here, especially in South Africa. Um, I think it resonates the work that I do um, a lot with the history of South Africa, and I'm very happy to be in this beautiful conference, Decolonizing Feminism. So I want to thank all of those who organized and brought me here, Melissa, Yako, Alfred and all the others who have been in correspondence with me and make sure that I could come here. Today I'm going to present, not a lecture, I also want to thank William who just presented me. I'm not presenting a lecture, but a lecture performance because in this piece I'm jumping in between disciplines and formats. And that is very much what decolonizing knowledge for me is. I thought I would start with a book that I like very much, uh, of Bell Hooks, with a small citation that has always been present in me and in my work, and that has always encouraged me to do the work that I do. But this citation also brought me a new perspective of, of what decolonizing knowledge could be. And it's a book by Bell Hooks called Teaching to Transgress. And there is this beautiful uh, article, essay inside, uh, where she explores and talks about teaching and about doing theory. And it goes like this. I came to theory because I was hurting. The pain within me was so intense that I could not go on living. I came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around me. I came to theory to understand. Most importantly, I wanted to make the hurt go away. That's what theory was for. I saw in theory then a location for healing. This is a very beautiful citation and it reminded me that theory should exactly be this place of belonging, this place of liberation. But if we go back to the academia and to the many dominant spaces where we are, Theory and knowledge is usually a very violent and colonial performance, not a place of liberation. And what is in this citation as well is that theory, knowledge, production, and subjectivity and biography are together. I produce something that has to do with my biography, and my biography theorizes something. And this is for me the very simple base of decolonizing knowledge, is when we contradict colonial knowledge production that creates an object and a distance another that describes and classifies and talks about. And instead, we start positioning ourselves in our narrative, so the biography makes part of theory. And when biography makes part of theory, there's a whole dimension of emotionality that also makes part of it, of subjectivity, of storytelling. And in this way, we enter already then a level where artistic and academic languages start confining. And this is very much what I do in my work, and that's what I wanted to present <coughs> to you today. I try to create hybrid spaces where these different formats come together because I'm interested in telling a story and I, sometimes I don't know how am I going to tell it. But then the format through memories and through images and associations, then the format comes out. And it can be a theoretical text, but it can also be poetry or it can be film, video or installation or performance. And so what I prepared for this um, decolonizing knowledge, this lecture performance, was a collage of texts 
of written text, of film, of performance and video installation for you. Okay? The first text. In the living room of my grandmother's house, there was a picture of Schkafla and Anastasia above the sofa on the left side of the wall. Every Friday, we put a candle, a white flower, a glass of clean water, and a bowl of fresh coffee with no sugar. My grandmother used to tell me how Shkav Anastasia was incarcerated in a mask, as it was common to those who spoke words of emancipation during slavery. And I should always remember her, she said. Shkava Nastasi is related to the Orisha Oshala. That's my Orisha. You should always remember her. I remember because this story has been memorized. I cannot forget it. The colonial past is memorized in a way that one is unable to forget it. Sometimes one would prefer not to remember, but the theory of memory is in reality a theory of forgetting. One cannot simply forget, and one cannot avoid remembering. <coughs> the mask that my grandmother used to speak about cannot be forgotten. It was a very, very concrete piece, a real instrument which became part of the European colonial project for more than 300 years. It was composed of a bit placed inside the mouth of the black subject, clamped between the tongue and the jaw, and fixed behind the head with two strings, one surrounding the chin, and the second surrounding the nose and the forehead. The mask was used by white masters to prevent enslaved Africans from eating sugar cane and cacao beans while working on the plantations, as well as to prevent them from dirt eating, a common practice to commit suicide and to escape the horrors of slavery. But its primary function was to implement a sense of punishment, silence, and fear. The fear of speaking. This violent scenario that I cannot forget raises then many questions. Who can speak and who cannot? And above all, what can we speak about? Why must the mouth of the black subject be fastened? Why must she, he, it, or they become silent? What could the black subject say if its mouth were not sealed? And most importantly, what would the white subject have to listen to? There is this apprehensive fear that if the colonial subject speaks, the colonizer will have to listen. It would be forced into uncomfortable confrontations with other knowledges. Knowledges which are not supposed to be spoken, to be heard, and which should be kept quiet as a secret. I like this expression of kept quiet as secrets. It announces how someone is about to reveal what is presumed not to be told. Secrets like slavery, colonialism, secrets like racism. The fear of listening to what could possibly be revealed can actually be articulated with the idea of repression. Repression means lies exactly in turning something away and keeping it a distance from the conscience. It is that process by which certain knowledges can only exist in the unconscious due to the extreme anxiety, guilt, or shame that they cause. So to say, one knows, but one wants to make the known unknown. I don't understand what you are saying. I actually don't remember that. I don't really believe in what you're saying. I think you exaggerate a little bit. No, you are too sensitive about the topic. These 
These are the common expressions of repression in which one resists making the unconscious information conscious and in this way keeping it as a secret. The mouth then is a very, very special organ. It's not only the organ of enunciation, but also of possession. It's the organ that speaks, and speaking here becomes virtually impossible. It is not that we have not been speaking, but rather that our voices through racism have been systematically silent. This impossibility illustrates how speaking and silencing emerge almost as a, an analogous project a project between the speaking subject and the listeners. For instance, in this scenario here, you are the listeners, and I was invited to come here to be the speaking subject. I speak, and you listen to me. And I only become the speaking subject because all of you have decided until now to listen to me. That's why, from the speaker, I become the speaking subject. What would happen if I continue speaking, but you decide not to listen to me anymore? I would like to try that with you. I'm going to count until three, and I'm going to ask you to start speaking on your own, or with your neighbor. But when I say stop, you should stop, all right? <laughs> should we try that one? Yeah? One, two, three. I continue here. As I said, what happens is that I am the speaker and the one listens. And I continue reading my text like I did before. There's no difference at all. But suddenly I'm not the speaker or the speaking subject anymore because of what's speaking is the same as me. Thank you. Stop. Very good. This is just like a small performative moment how we can perform knowledge in the room, how can we bring theory into performance. But in the moment that you start speaking, in the moment that you are not listening to me anymore, I am not a speaking subject anymore. The act of speaking is indeed like a negotiation between those who speak and those who listen, that is, between the speaking subjects and the listeners. Listening is, in this sense, the act of authorization towards the speaker. I would say even one can only speak when one's voice is listened to. But it's even more complicated. Being listened to goes beyond this dialectic. Being listened to also means belonging. We all know that those who belong are those who are listened to. And those who are not listened to are also those who do not belong. So the mask recreates this project of controlling the possibility that the colonized one day can be listened to and consequently might belong. That's the end of the first story. So I think that would be a good passage for the next project which is a film, a film called Konakri, um, that speaks exactly about this, who can speak and who cannot, and who are the speaking subjects and who are not. And this is a beautiful film made by a wonderful filmmaker, Philippa Cesar, who invited me and another woman uh, Diana McCarthy, who's a wonderful activist, and the three of us put this film together. So it was a film made by three women. Um, I had the task of writing and performing, and it's a film based on Amilcar Cabral, and Amilcar Cabral, as you know, was one of the most important leaders of the African liberation movement. Um, in uh, Cabo Verde and Guinea-Bissau, so very much related to the Portuguese colonization. As I come from Portugal, Angola, and Santo Mé Príncipe, he was very meaningful, but he was absent. We didn't know about him. 
he was not documented in the books. And so the film touched very much these questions of the mask that I read to you before. The film, as you will see, touches another element of decolonizing knowledge that for me is very beautiful. For me is the, the, the element of the ghosts. I think the colonial history is like a ghost that keeps interrupting us and, and, and interrupting our everyday life because it was never properly buried. And I see very much the work of decolonizing knowledge as a proper burial that we put together pieces of our history that were never told properly. For me, it was a little bit like paying on, an honor to Amilcar Cabral and to understand what his story and who this person was, but to put the pieces together. And I think this is one element of us as a younger generation to decolonize knowledge, is to tell history properly. So what you see is we work with footage of the archive, footage that has appeared during the colonial time, and we gave voice as as a new generation of artists, we gave voice to this footage to tell the story anew. Um, Julian, can we can we see Conakry, please? I'm delighted to inform the public that after more than 30 years, the Ghanaian Film Archive is to be made accessible. Around 40 hours of film were digitized in the summer of 2012. The focus is on works by Jose Bolama Kabumba, Josefina Crato, Flora Gomes, and Sana Enhada. They shot the films between 1972 and 1980 in Guinea-Bissau, during the struggle for independence and consequent post-independence nation building material evidence of the birth of a Ghanaian film production. In 1967, Amilcar Cabral sent these four young Ghanaians to Cuba to be trained in filmmaking at the Instituto Cubano de Arte e Industria Cinematográficos. There, they assisted Santiago Alvarez. In 1972, the four returned to Guinea-Bissau to document the independence movement. Early media activists the archive includes a mix of raw footage, documentary films, newsreels, and sound, some sent from countries that supported the Ghanaian struggle. Chris Marker left films there in 1979. In 2012, Felipe Cesar and Nacho Cheka traveled to Bissau shortly after the April 12th coup d'etat to bring the film material to Berlin. For years, these films were stored at the National Film and Audiovisual Institute of Guinea-Bissau founded by Mario de Andrade in 1977. The 16 millimeter film rolls in varying states of decay are being digitized with a prototype film reader designed by engineer Reiner Meyer. For technical, economic, and diplomatic reasons, the sound should be recovered and digitized at a later date. The originals and digital copies will be returned to Bissau in late 2012. This is the House of World Cultures in Berlin. In 1957, it was a Congress center, a gift from the United States of America to West Germany. That is Grada Colomba, the Portuguese writer. She will share her readings of particular footage from this archive. Conakry, September 1972, the week of information. One of Cabral's less known laboratories. The colonization, what a beautiful word written in images, picture by picture, a visual language portrayed in each one of these reels. Here cinema, 
becomes a the colonial act. In 1956, Amilcar Cabral founded the African Party for the Independence of Guinea-Bissau and Cape Verde. For 11 years, he led the armed resistance to Portuguese colonialism. This West African struggle ended in 1974 with the fall of the Portuguese dictatorship. This is the People's Palace in Conakry. In 1967, this Congress Center was partly a gift from China to the People's Revolutionary Republic of Guinea. I am speaking because the sounds belonging to these images have not arrived yet. Maybe they never will. What I speak and have to say may never be what these reels want to tell, but I tell you and I reassure you that the name Amilcar Cabral was never revealed to me in my history books, nor mentioned in my classroom in Lisbon, where other black children and I sat in the back. My memories are not sweet, though they could have been. They could have been memories of pride, if these images have been shown to me earlier before. They do not come late. They come on time. That is Amilcar Cabral. Here he performs the role of host and curator, receiving his guests, offering them tours of his event. These are historical moments. Which history? The struggle for African independence? The political strength of tradition and modernity? Militant filmmaking in Africa? Any of those? Stokely Carmichael, the ex-minister of the Black Panther Party, and his wife, the South African singer Miriam Makiba, entered the building. André Touré, Guinea Conakry's first lady, arrives. Sekou Touré, the president of Guinea Conakry, a guest of Cabral in his own country. José Bulama, Kobumba, Josefina Crato, Flora Gomes, and Sana Nehada, the four young filmmakers who have just returned from Cuba, captured the colonial act. They captured the blink of strength, looks of competence and sovereignty mixed with joy and fulfillment. They captured the images that I would have liked to have seen as a child. Even without sound, these images tell a story. Rather many stories, but whose? The subjects, four young filmmakers, the citizens of an unstable post-revolutionary Guinea-Bissau, the world? I chose the world. Then it is also my story. Why should these images interest me? One from a distant desert. Fragments reach New Mexico via San Soleil. Not these exact images, but traces of this story. Cabral's hand gently points to a new identity, his continent given a new body, his history given a new language, his people given a new shelter, his language recovered, Numbers, statistics, documents, maps, pictures, books, a whole room full of empirical evidence against those intrusive memories of subordination. The eroding film, eroding time, and eroding space. These images are so far away, but also so near. Are they memories? lost ones or found ones. What about the children in their crisp pioneer uniforms? What happened to them? They would be my age, my contemporaries. Do they remember this moment fondly?
Cabral points at the arsenal confiscated from the Portuguese army, unfolds the Portuguese flag to Madame Touré. There is no bitterness in his gestures, nor in his words. In December 1966, during the liberation struggle, he writes a letter to all the Portuguese soldiers. Nesta quadra do ano, em que as famílias comemoram a sua existência e se renovam nos corações dos homens as esperanças de uma vida melhor, tenho o prazer de vos dirigir saudações fraternais e combativas em nome da direção do nosso partido e do nosso povo. Somos a mesma família porque enfrentamos juntos os mesmos problemas. There is something else. These are revolutionaries in the midst of revolution. Is this how a revolution imagines itself? So beautiful. The colonization was a global act, an act of humanism, where each single individual was invited to join, all gathered in the same room. Women and men, children and adults, from North and South, speaking a common virtual language. These moments captured in topographic celluloid. Four months later, Amilcar Cabral was assassinated. This raw footage almost disappeared, making us believe this has never existed. Questions? So this is Conakry. This film um, talks very much about what we know and what we don't, and this footage completely disappeared. That brings me to the next story that I want to read to you. On the very first day of each semester, I count how many students are in the room and I ask them to raise their hands in case they know the answer to the questions I'm going to ask. This is in Berlin, Germany. I start by asking very simple questions. In Berlin, Germany, at the Humboldt University, where the students are in the fourth, fifth, sixth semester, I start with very simple questions, such as What was the Berlin Conference, 1884-85? Which Asian and African countries were colonized by Germany? How many years did the German colonization last? And then I conclude with more specific questions, such as, who was Amilcar Cabral? Who was Queen Nzinga? When was Patrice Lumumba assassinated? Who was Maya Him? <coughs> who wrote Black Skin, White Masks? Name a book by Steve Biko. Name a book by Audrey Lord. There is no answer. I can hardly understand that students can go as far as the fifth semester and don't know what the Berlin Conference was in Germany. They don't know that Otto von Bismarck invited all European countries to come to Berlin. They sat around the table and they put the map of the continent of Africa on the top and they divided the continent with a ruler. The borders that we still know. And they divided Africa in seven pieces. One for the Portuguese, one for the Spanish, one for the French, the Italian, the British, the Belgians, and the Germans. And they tell me, I did not know that we had a colonial history. 
The seminar is usually made up of 80 to 100 students, and most of them are reluctant to respond until finally a few, mostly students of color, black students, start carefully raising their hands as an answer. At that particular moment, the room becomes a performative space where the idea of knowledge is being exposed and questioned. They can actually visualize how the concept of knowledge <coughs> is linked with race, gender and power. Suddenly those who are usually unseen become visible and those who are always seen become invisible. Those who are usually silent start speaking and those who always speak and know everything become silent. Silent not because they cannot articulate their voices or tongues, but rather because they do not possess that knowledge. Who knows what and who doesn't? And why? What knowledge is acknowledged as such and what knowledge is not? What knowledge has been made part of the official agendas and what knowledge has not? Whose knowledge is this? Who is acknowledged to have knowledge and who is not? Who can teach knowledge and who cannot? The concept of knowledge as we see is not a simple apolitical study of truth, but rather the reproduction of racial and gender power relations, which define not only what counts as true, but also in whom to believe. Who is acknowledgeable? Knowledgeable becomes then all epistemologies that reflect the specific political interests of a white colonial patriarchal society. Let me explain again what epistemology is. Epistemology derives from the Greek words episteme, meaning knowledge, and logos, meaning science. It is the science of acquisition of knowledge. That means it determines first the themes. Which themes, which topics deserve attention? And which questions merit to be questioned? Second, the paradigms. Which narratives and interpretations can be used to explain a phenomenon? So to say, from which perspective can we produce knowledge? And third, the methods. Which form and format can be used to produce truthful knowledge? So epistemology decides what can we talk about, which questions we can ask, from which perspective can we look at them and explore them, and in which format. It defines not only how to produce knowledge, but also who can produce it. Because we don't all speak from the same place, and we don't all have the same questions. We don't all have the same perspectives, and we don't all have the same formats to explain a phenomenon. It is so common during the time that I'm teaching that the students come and say, my work was rejected. I was told that it's not objective at all. Your work is not neutral. It's too specific, a little bit too black. You have to be more universal. Your problem is that you over-interpret reality. You must think that you are the queen of interpretation. These are remarks of everyday life. These are remarks that illustrate this colonial and patriarchal hierarchy in which we recede. As soon as we start speaking and delivering knowledge, 
our voices are silent by these comments, which actually function like a metaphorical mask. They place our discourse back at the margin as Vian knowledge, while white discourses remain at the center as the norm. When they speak, it is scientific. When we speak, it's unscientific. When they speak, it's universal. When we speak, it's specific. When they speak, it's objective. When we speak, it's subjective. When they speak, it's neutral. When we speak, it's personal. When they speak, it's rational. We are emotional. They are impartial. We are very personal. Yes. They have facts. We have opinions. They have knowledge. We have experiences. We are not dealing here with a peaceful game of words, but rather with a violent hierarchy which defines who can speak. This is a good moment to go to the next video. Julian, this is a video. I hate when people touch my hair. Ask me where I'm from. I never felt that before in my body. In my fingers. I explained to her that I do not like that. She told me her Cuban friend likes it. I grew up hearing this word. It must be something bad. He apologized immediately. How do I wash my hair? With water and shampoo. She committed suicide. I think she was very lonely. I could not believe it. He smelled my hair and sang that song. About monkeys. I had to be better than all the others. Three times. Oh. Black and smart. Angry. I am not aggressive. Angry because this is aggressive. Yes, I combat. I do not want to be better. Imagine being the only black person in the family. I do not want to be worse. I realized how much of myself I have out at risk. I had to read a lot. Learn. Study. I read many books. People always ask me, where do I come from, since I was a child. They see you and the first thing that crosses their mind is to check, where is she from? They just ask without even knowing you. It does not matter where you are at, in a bus, at a party, on the street, at dinner, or even in the supermarket. I am being asked in the first place because I am categorized as a race, which does not belong. And if I answer and say that I am German, they look confused. They, they stop for a moment like thinking, German? Or they just start laughing as if I misunderstood the question or gave the wrong answer, you know? And they go, oh, no, 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 but you cannot be German. You don't look German, pointing at my skin. <coughs> One is black or German, not black and German. <coughs> It seems one can only exist through an alienated image of oneself. The question contains the colonial fantasy that German means white and black means Ausländer. I have to add another component, race and voyeurism. People come to ask where I am from because they have pleasure through the exhibition of otherness. They are not interested in hearing that I am from Berlin, <coughs> but rather they want to hear a very exotic story where the colonial fantasies about the remote other are revived. I am expected to provoke pleasure. I am addressed impatiently. Question. What about your parents? Where are they from? Ich fühle mich wie Antaios im Kampf mit Herakles. 
Entrissen meiner Kräfte, erwürgt von Herakles. Ich fühle mich wie Antaios im Kampf mit Herakles. Entrissen meiner Kräfte, erwürgt von Herakles. Ich fühle mich wie Antaios im Kampf mit Herakles. Entrissen meiner Kräfte, erwürgt von Herakles. Ich fühle mich wie Antaios im Kampf mit Herakles. Entrissen meiner Kräfte.
And by doing so, she defines to the black woman what real scholarship is and how it should be expressed. This reveals the complexity of the intersection between gender, race, and power. But this is another story that many of you have been discussing in the last two days in a wonderful way. In the second moment, she then speaks of hierarchical places, of a queen she fantasizes. We want to become, but we cannot. The queen is a very interesting metaphor. It is a metaphor for power. It is also a metaphor of the idea that certain bodies belong to certain places. Such demarcation of spaces introduces a dynamic in which blackness signifies being outside place. One is outside place as a body that is not at home. Within racism, black bodies are constructed as improper bodies, as bodies that are not at home, as bodies that cannot belong. In this way, white bodies are then constructed as proper, as clean, as bodies that are in place, as bodies that belong, that are at home everywhere, always. Through such comments, black people are persistently invited to return to their place, outside the academia, outside the structures, at the margins, where the body belongs, where the body is at home. The academia is, in this sense, neither a neutral space, nor simply a space of knowledge and wisdom, of science and scholarship, but it is also a space of violence. It is a space that has, historically, a very, very problematic relationship with blackness. Here we have been objectified, classified, theorized, dehumanized, infantilized, criminalized, brutalized, sexualized, exposed, exhibited, and sometimes also killed. What else? What else could it be for me than asks for me? But an amputation, an excision, an hemorrhage that spattered my whole body and with black blood. He uses the language of trauma when speaking of his everyday experiences, like most of black people, indicating the painful, bodily impact and loss characteristic of a traumatic collapse. For within racism, one is like surgically removed and violently separated of whatever identity one might really have. I felt knife blades open within me, he writes, I could no longer laugh. There is indeed nothing to laugh about, as one is being over-determined from outside by violent fantasies one sees, but one does not recognize as being oneself. And then he continues and says, I cannot go to a film. I wait for me. He waits for the black savages, the black barbarians, the servants, the prostitutes, the whores, the courtesans, the criminals, the murderers, and the drug dealers. He waits for what he is not. What an alienation, isn't it? To be forced to relate to oneself and to give a performance of oneself, scripted by the white subject. What a disappointment to be forced to look at oneself as if one is in their place, in the place of the other. And what a pain to be trapped still in this colonial order that persists in interrupting our lives like a ghost. This colonial history that was never treated properly is a wound that keeps bleeding and interrupting our lives. Julian, can we see the next one, please? Today, I expose what has been kept quiet as a secret. 
I expose racism without regret, pity, shame, or guilt. I once had this conversation with a childhood friend about black people and I told her how it is being black here and that it is not easy for me always to be the only black person. She listened attentively while I was speaking and then she said, well, but for me you are not black. I don't think that you are black. And she said that in a way as if she was doing me a favor. I even forget that you're black. Du bist nicht wirklich schwarz. I don't think that you're black. Du bist aber nur halb schwarz. Im Sommer bin ich genauso dunkel wie du. Well, for me, you're not black. I would say we are talking about negation. This infernal circle. When people like me, they say that I'm not black. When they dislike me, they say that it is not because I'm black. Either way, I am trapped in their racisms. Me and my boyfriend used to go to a cafe and have long, long conversations. We used to spend a long time there. We had all kinds of conversation about nothing really special. He was a jazz musician. And I remember one day he was telling me what kind of jokes he and his musician's friends used to tell. And I asked him, tell me one. He said that he cannot. And I said, ah, oh, come on, tell me. And then he explained that he knows one joke but he cannot really tell and I insisted. Come on, tell me, tell me. He got a piece of paper and drew a circle with two triangles inside and asked me, what is it about? It looks like a red cross sign that has been erased. <laughs> no, there's two Ku Klux Klan members looking down at the black man who was thrown into the hole. <laughs> I started feeling this pain in my body, an ache in my hands and in my fingers. It hurt. <coughs> My whole body was in pain. Me too was placed below his white feet. Desire and envy. A white jazz musician playing the music of the black man desiring him, and at the same time, murdering the black man, for he cannot be black. It is a lynch. In his fantasy, he is lynching the black man. Are you aware what a lynch is? Black men beaten to death are cut in pieces, subjected to rituals of castration, and hanged in trees like strange fruits, as the song tells, pieces of black men, hands, tongues, ears, testicles, fingers, penises, there, hanging in trees like fruits. Strange, isn't it? Violently strange. I think, I think that this desire for the death of the black man is in fact an unsolved Oedipus complex. What do you think?
The second video is, um, there's a moment that speaks about Billy Oliver. That was a time when um, it was the 100th cent, uh, anniversary of the death of Billy Holiday. And I was listening to Billy Holiday a lot. And I got to know a history, a story better. And it's really a story of criminalization where she was strongly criminalized and ended up dying very young, alone at the hospital, surrounded by um, FBI agents. Since she dared to sing this song, Strange Fruit, um, this song was composed by a Jewish man who um, brought the song to her saying it's necessary that you sing this song and uh, for the movement of liberation. And she said, I cannot. If I sing this, they will follow me. I will be not allowed to sing anymore. But they negotiated and, and she felt this political responsibility of through arts to change and to transform, and this is very much what we've been talking about, performing knowledge. How can you reach people with knowledge? How can you perform it? And then she decided to uh, sing and record this song, Strange Fruits, that talked about the common practice of, um, of beating and castrating and mutilating black people. Um, and that's what Strange Fruits is. And in this <coughs> video, you see different episodes. And in the second episode, um, the woman who's telling the story talks about that. And that's how it comes. It talk, talks about this criminalization and about this violence that is performed in the black body. And um, about this alienation and disappointment and pain. Back to the text. To decolonize knowledge, then we have to understand that we all speak from a very specific time and place, from a very specific reality and history. There are no neutral discourses. When it is claimed that there are neutral and objective discourses. Actually, those are voices of power that are not acknowledging that they too write from a specific place, which of course is neither neutral nor objective or universal, but dominant. They write from a place of power. There is this anecdote that there's a group of people in a room and the black woman raises her hand and says, she is a black woman. And uh, she is a black woman. And the white woman raises her hand and says, she is a woman. And the white man raises the hand and says, I'm a person. Whiteness is like other identities in power, an absent center. It remains unnamed, an absent center, an identity that is placed and that places itself at the center of everything, but its centrality is not regarded as relevant because it is presented as synonymous to human. In general, white people do not see themselves as white, but rather as people. And whiteness is felt to be the human condition. But it is exactly this equation that secures whiteness as the norm and as the normality, as the reference point from which others differ. They do different knowledge production. They do, they do have different knowledges, different questions, different perspectives, different narratives. It is exactly here, in this equation, that power recedes. There is no more powerful position than just being the norm and the normality. To decolonize knowledge then would mean that we have to unpack whiteness and power as well. It has to become visible.
And we have also to create new configurations of power. When we have new configurations of power, we also have new configurations of knowledge. And that would also mean that we would start positioning ourselves within our discourses. We would start saying from where are we writing and speaking, from which place, from which time, from which history, why these questions and how the questions are related to me. Biography would be attached to theory and theory to biography. So decolonizing knowledge also means creating subjective narratives where we position ourselves in the narrative. So if my words seem to preoccupy with narrating positions of subjectivity and positioning as part of the discourse, then it is worth remembering that theory is neither universal or neutral, but rather always placed somewhere and always written by someone. And this someone has a biography, has a place, has a time, has a history, and has a story. Yeah. Thank you very much. A video that is a draft back then and that now I developed into a bigger project that I'm going to present next week at the Biennale of São Paulo in Brazil. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you all. Thank you.